All right, today we're going to look at stoichiometry, all right? Um, this is going to be a fairly long uh, presentation, so if you need to take breaks in the middle, be sure to do so. You're going to need your periodic table. You're going to need a calculator for this. You're going to need scratch paper, all right? Throughout this uh, presentation, there are going to be times where I say, hey, pause it, work these problems. This is a chance for you to literally pause the video, work the problem, just like we would in class, and then hit play. We'll continue on, and you'll see the answers. Sometimes the answers are in the notes section at the bottom of the uh, PowerPoint slide. So if you're looking on the PowerPoint slide, down here there is a notes section. You can bring that up, make it larger. Push that button right there to show the notes right, right here. Okay? So um, as we go through this, just if I say, hey, pause it and work a problem, I would encourage you to do so. So here we go. All right, stoichiometry. What is stoichiometry? How do we use it? And what is it good for, right? Absolutely nothing. No, that's a song. Okay, um, what is stoichiometry? First, here's the definition. It is the quantitative, so numbers, the quantitative study of reactants and products in a given chemical reaction. That's all it is. It is going to let you convert from moles to moles, from moles to mass, or from mass to mass when you have two different um, substances, right, in your, in your related by a chemical formula. It's going to use our bracket system, the factor label dimensional analysis system. So that's what it is. What's the goal? Well, it's a conversion. So we're converting just like you would convert miles per hour to feet per second, or if you wanted to convert ounces to pounds or, you know, centimeters per second to light years per hour, right? If you want to convert anything, you use a conversion. We're converting starting material into products, so it's a conversion. However, these are not conversions that are just arbitrary, okay? They're not metric units in a vacuum. We're doing actual reactants into actual products or the other way around using a real chemical reaction. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, sorry. Okay, we're going to identify using math, okay, how much product can be made, how much reactant would have to be used, stuff like that, before we do actual chemistry in the lab. The point is, can we save ourselves some money? And I'm out of coffee. That's not a good thing. What do we need to be successful? All right, number one, you got to know your vocabulary. You got to be able to speak the language of chemistry in order to understand these word problems. More on that in a minute. We're going to be looking for something I like to call the givens, things that are given to you in the problem that are necessary for your success. All right. Some of those givens include molar ratios, molar masses, which is why you need to have your periodic table in order to do these problems. You need the balanced equation. If the equation is not given to you with coefficients, assume it's not balanced and balance it. You need to be able to convert between grams and moles using the periodic table. Okay, sometimes that'll be given to you. As always, please use a calculator when you do this. All right, I, I don't know why you wouldn't, but please do use a calculator. Uh, what are they going to look like? That's always a good question. Well, basically, you're going to be given some amount of reactants. It might be grams, kilograms. It might be a number of atoms. It could just be a number of moles. And you're going to be asked to find... Um, some amount of product in mass, atoms, or moles, right? Here's an example. We have 2A plus 3B produces 2C. Here's the question. If you have 43.2 milligrams right, of A and excess B, so all the B that we could ever want, how many milligrams of C can be formed? That would be an example of a stoic problem. We're starting with A and we're converting to C. B is in excess, so we're not really worried about it. Keep this in mind. This formula up here, this 2A plus uh, 3B equals 2C, that's a recipe. It's just like baking a cake, all right? So as long as you follow the recipe, you'll get C from A and B. Now that vocab we talked about, all right? Number one, um, a reactant. That's on the back end of the yield arrow, right? The arrow points away from the reactants. It's going to get turned into some new product by a chemical reaction. The product is the thing that we're making. The yield error is going to point at the products. The mole ratio, that's when you compare the coefficients in front of the reactants and the products to one another. We'll do that in a moment. 
If you see the word excess, in this context, it means that there's enough of it to do the reaction and you're gonna have some left over. And then limiting, again, in this context, the limiting reactant is going to run out. When it runs out, there's nothing else on the reactant side that can react to make the product. The reaction is gonna stop. It's basically the opposite of the excess reactant. And we find who limits and who is in excess, which, which one of the reactants uh, using math. So let's look at a couple of these. Let's find the mole ratio for this equation. Well, we wanna look at the coefficients and we can say the mole ratio is two to one to two. Two magnesiums for every one O2 will result in two MgOs. So if I asked you, what's the ratio of oxygen to magnesium oxide, you would say one to two. If I said, what's the ratio of uh, magnesium to magnesium oxide, you would say one to one, because remember, we always reduce the ratio. All right, we wouldn't want to say two to two, we'd say one to one. Here's another one. This is the photosynthesis equation, all right, or sorry, the cell respiration equation. Glucose plus six oxygens, um, six oxygen molecules produces six carbon dioxide molecules and six water molecules. So what's the mole ratio? Well, it's one to six to six to six. If you ask me the ratio of glucose to any of the other compounds, it's going to be one to six. If it's oxygen to carbon dioxide or water to oxygen or water to CO2, it's going to be one to one because we want to reduce them. Some things we want to know. First of all, if you are at STP, if you see STP in a problem, one mole of a gas, so 6.22 times 10 to the 23rd, um, 6.022, excuse me, times 10 to the 23rd uh, atoms of a gas or molecules of a gas, that's one mole, it will occupy 22.4 liters at standard temperature and pressure, STP. STP is one atmosphere of pressure, so it's the pressure above you at sea level at zero degrees Celsius, which is the same thing as 273 degrees Kelvin. Um, just keep in mind, if you want to find Kelvin, because this is a, a useful thing later on, Kelvin is really simple. It's degrees Celsius plus 273.15. We usually just leave the 0.15 off, all right? Anyway, um, we'll talk more about STP when we get to gas loss, okay? That'll be in a couple weeks. Second thing, molar mass is always in grams per mole, and you always use the periodic table to find it, right? Unless they give it to you, look it up on the, on the periodic table, okay? Make sure you know Avogadro's number, right? One mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles, right? It could be atoms, it could be molecules, right? Just make sure you know which one you're talking about. Now, before we get into any full-blown stoic problems, I want to look at a couple other math problems that are involved in stoichiometry. They're not true stoichiometry in that they are conversions, okay, but they are math problems that we need to be able to do. There are three of them, so let's look at those first. If you need to take a break, take a break. All right, the first formula we want to look at is find, or the first math um, process or operation is finding the percent composition of a compound. Now, this is a really simple uh, exercise. To find the percent composition or the part of something, of, a, of the whole rather, um, you're going to do the mass of the part divided by the mass of the whole times 100 to get the percent composition. This will tell you the percentage by mass of every component atom in some molecule. You're going to use the periodic table to get the masses. The masses are going to be in grams per mole. So let's look at those. We've got water. All right, H2O. How do I know that H2O has a total mass of 18.015 grams per mole? Well, it's really simple. On the periodic table, I know that hydrogen is 1.008 grams per mole. I have two of them. So that is 2.016 grams per mole. I only have one oxygen, and it's 15.999 grams per mole. So I'm going to add these two things together. So that and that, I'm going to add them together, and it tells me the mass of water. I want to know the percent composition of everything in it. So I need to know the hydrogen part, and I need to know, I need to know the oxygen part. So for hydrogen, I'm going to do the mass of the hydrogen, which we just figured out right here. There's the hydrogen. Is 2.016 grams per mole. 
divided by the mass of the whole thing, part over whole times 100. When I punch that into my calculator, I get 11.15% hydrogen. So here's what that means. In a water molecule, 11.2% of it by mass is hydrogen. If I want to do oxygen, I do the part that's oxygen, which this is the part that's oxygen, divided by the whole thing, right? There's the whole, part over whole times 100, and I get 88.85% oxygen. Now here's the nice thing about percent composition. You'll know you did it right if all of the parts add up to 100, right? It's a percent. It means out of 100. So if I want to check my work, I just do 11.15 plus 88.85, right? Add those together. Well, 5 and 5 make 10. 8 and 2 make 10. 8 and 2 make 10. 8 and 2 make 10. A hundred percent. Hey, if we get 100 or we get really, really close to 100, we know we did the problem right. Here are two for you guys to go do. Okay. Now I didn't put the answers to these in the, the notes section um, because these are that easy. I think you can figure them out. But remember, we want to do part over whole. So I'll, I'll kind of start this one out for you. So part over whole times 100. Well, carbon is 12.011 grams per mole. Two oxygens is 31.998 grams per mole. So the whole thing is going to be nine. Carry the one. There we go. Wait, why did I carry it? One? Ten. Yep, there we go. Ten. Cool. One. Four. 44.009. Okay, grams per mole. That's going to be the whole thing. So I'm going to do 12.011 over 44.009 times 100, that's going to give me carbon, I feel like that's not right, let's use a calculator, right, we said use a calculator, 12.011 plus 31, no, that's right, okay, never mind, okay, that's going to give me my carbon percent, and then for my oxygen, I'm going to do 31.998 over 44.009, times 100, and that's going to give me my oxygen percent by mass. Remember, carbon plus oxygen, if I add these, I should get about 100%. You guys can do the last one. That's the first one. Here's the second thing we want to do. And remember, these three functions are related. So now that we know how to find percent composition, we're going to use percent composition to find an empirical formula. So if we're given a set of percentages and we assume we have 100 grams, we can use that in order to calculate an empirical formula. But before I go any further, why can I assume there's 100 grams? Well, if I'm talking about percents, that's per 100. If I just assume, hey, I got a 100 gram sample, then in that sample, the percentages are just the grams that are present. Okay, so let's look at that. I have a sample that's 60 percent carbon. 13.4% hydrogen and 26.6% oxygen. Let's find the empirical formula of this compound. So I'm going to assume I have a 100 gram total sample. That means I have 60 grams of carbon, 13.4 grams of hydrogen, and 26.6 grams of oxygen. I'm going to use the periodic table to convert grams to moles. So if I do 60 grams of carbon, right, my conversion tells me put the grams on the bottom, go to moles. I get 4.995 moles of carbon. I'm going to do the same thing with hydrogen. I'm going to use uh, the periodic table and the molar mass to convert grams of hydrogen to moles of hydrogen. Give me 13.27 moles of hydrogen. And for oxygen, I'm going to go 26.6 grams of O divided by 15.999 grams of oxygen per one mole. And that's going to give me 1.666 moles of oxygen. Now, all of these, this bracket right here, this is molar mass, all right, from the periodic table. And remember from when we did conversions, all right, if I want to go um, and convert grams to moles, grams to moles, that's one bracket. So I have grams of X. And then from the periodic table, I do grams of X, periodic table, per one 
mole of x. And that will give me moles of x. So that's what I've done here. You might be asking, why do we try to find moles if we're trying to find an empirical formula? Well, if I take all these things, those moles are the subscripts of a formula. But there's a problem, right? We can't have decimals there. So what do we do? Well, we need to reduce it. So we're going to divide by the smallest one of those subscripts. So I have three subscripts. The smallest one is obviously 1.666. So I'm going to divide all three of those numbers by 1.666. And when I do that, I get whole numbers. C3, H8, and O is going to be a 1 because anything divided by itself is 1. When I get those whole numbers, I know I can stop. That's my empirical formula. It can't be reduced. We're good to go. If you do this step and you get something like, this is hypothetical, but let's say I got C3.5, H8, O1. Well, then I would need to multiply. I need to scale it up to get rid of that decimal. So if I multiply everything by a factor of 2, I would have C7, H16, O2. And that would give me a whole number, and I could stop there. All right, you'll learn, as we do some more of these, how to spot those decimals. So if you see a 0.5, you're going to multiply everything by 2. If you were to see a 0.25, all right, well, then I'm going to multiply everything by 4. If I had a 0.33, all right, well, I'm going to multiply everything by 3, so on and so forth. Let's say I got a 0.2. I'm going to multiply everything by 5. I just want to scale it up. Here are a couple for you guys to work on your own. In the notes there at the bottom, you can see the right answer for both of these. All right, so I'm going to um, let you guys work those. Okay, so pause them, work them, make sure you can get the right answer. Remember, assume you have grams, right? Those percentages are going to add up to 100. Convert grams to moles. Divide by the smallest mole that you end up with. That's the subscripts for your formula. If that doesn't work out to a nice even number pretty much right away, then you know, hey, I'm going to have to double it or triple it. I might have to multiply by four, maybe by five, maybe by six. You never know. Okay, so take that one step at a time. When you're done with that, if you need to take a break, take a break, and then we're going to start the third uh, process. So the third process is to take that empirical formula and find a molecular formula. Now, two things we need to keep in mind. Empirical means reduced. Molecular means unreduced. All right, so let's look at this. We have an unknown sample of 60.06 .06 grams per mole that's found to have the empirical formula of CH2O. What's the molecular formula of this sample? So the first thing I want to do is I want to mass my empirical formula. I want to know what CH2O weighs. So I'm going to add a carbon. I have one of them. I have two hydrogens. And I have one oxygen. I'm going to add them together and I'm going to get a mass. That mass turns out to be 30.026 grams per mole. The second thing I want to do is I want to compare the ratio between the empirical and the molecular formula. So in order to do that, anytime we're doing ratios, we're going to divide. In this case, I'm going to do the big divided by the little. So 60.06 .06 came from our problem. 30.026 came from the math we just did. And the ratio between those two, because grams per mole cancels out, is 2. The last thing I want to do is I want to multiply the empirical subscript, uh, subscripts by that molar ratio. So in this case, I'm going to take C1H2O, and I'm going to multiply all those subscripts by 2, right? So this 2 right here is this 2. I'm going to multiply those. That's going to scale it up for me, and it's going to give me a molecular formula. Now, I could reduce this, but I don't because the question asks me for a molecular formula. All right. I think of the three, this is probably, well, percent composition is the easiest part over whole. This one's probably the second easiest because we're just going to divide to get a ratio. If you get a number here that's smaller than one, if this number is smaller than one, you know you did it wrong. Okay, It needs to be a number bigger than one. Here are two for you guys to do on your own. Again, the answer is in the notes right at the bottom of um, the PowerPoint. So check your work. <coughs> Excuse me. We've got three functions, right? Three abilities. We can, we can do percent comp, we can do empirical formulas, and we can do molecular formulas. We want to know these really well because you can actually go back and forth between them. So here would be an example of that. 
have a sample and we have some percentages. It gives us an experimental molar mass, so a molar mass that we found in the lab. And it says, what is the molecular formula? All right, well, the answer is in the notes section. I'm going to let you work it. But basically, you just need to do it one step at a time. First, find the empirical formula. So convert your percents to grams, right? You assume 100 grams total. Just change the percent to grams. Go grams to moles. That's one bracket. Divide by the smallest number of moles. If you That should give you an a empirical formula, an empirical formula. Then mass the empirical formula. Do the big divided by the little, right? The experimental mass is probably going to be bigger than your uh, empirical mass. And that will give you the number by which to scale everything up. The answer is in um, the answer is in the uh, the notes. So work it. If you can't figure out how to get there, shoot me an email. I'll walk you through it. Now this flow chart's really important. Now that we know those three math functions, okay, we're going to get into some stoichiometry. Those math functions involve this flow chart, but not to the same degree that. Um, that stoichiometry does. So here's what this flow chart is. It's like a railroad track or it's a thought diagram. This will help you convert anything. So if I have known substance A and some unknown substance B and I want to convert, this will let me do it. So if I know the mass of A, I can convert mass to moles using the molar mass from the periodic table. And I'll go mass of A to mole of A. If I have a balanced equation, I can convert from moles of A to moles of B. And then using the periodic table, I could go from moles of B straight to the mass of B. Now, each time you cross one of these lines, you're going to use a bracket. So to go from mass of A to mole of A, that's a one bracket conversion. To go from mass of A to moles of B, that would be a two bracket conversion. To go from mass of A to mass of B, that would be a three bracket conversion. If I want to go from the volume of A, to moles. I use that fact from earlier in the period or earlier in the slideshow. One mole occupies 22.4 liters of volume at STP. Then I can use the coefficients from the balanced equation to go to moles of B. And then I could reconvert to volume of B using that same 22.4 liters. Again, to go from we'll say position one, all right, to position two, that would take one bracket. From two to three, that would take one bracket, right? Anytime I cross one of these arrows, that's a bracket. And from three to four, that would be another bracket. So this would be a one, two, three bracket conversion. I can also do particles, right? Like one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms or molecules. That gets me to moles. Moles, if I use the coefficients from a balanced equation, gets me to moles of B. And then I can go from moles of B to particles of B if I use Avogadro's number. So this roadmap right here will let you convert mass, volume, or particles of A to mass, volume, or particles of something else, something B. Here's the big takeaway. You've got to have coefficients from a balanced equation in order to do that. So if you're not using your balanced equation in your mole-to-mole -mole or in any of your stoichiometry calculations, you know you're doing something wrong. It also is really, really important that it's the balanced equation. Not every equation we give you in chemistry is a balanced equation. Make sure it's balanced. So let's look at a mole-to-mole -mole calculation. How many moles of water can be generated? from a reaction of four moles of molecular oxygen and excess hydrogen. Now, something to keep in mind here, if we were writing this equation, molecular oxygen indicates it's not O by itself, it's O2. Hydrogen also is not H, it's H2. I know that because it's one of the seven diatomic molecules that we memorized earlier in the year when we didn't name it. So make sure you know that O2 and H2 are the native states of oxygen and hydrogen, right? Know your, your Brinkelhoff, your seven diatomic molecules. But here's my equation. H2 plus O2 yields H2O. I went ahead and balanced it for you, all right? So 2, 1, 2. And in this case, I'm converting from moles of A, all right, to moles of B, all right? So four moles of molecular oxygen, that's going to be my A 
and I want how many moles of water, that's going to be my B. So I'm going moles of A to moles of B. So if I scroll back, if I'm going from moles of A to moles of B, I only have to cross one bridge, so that is a one bracket conversion. So I write my given from the problem I was given four moles of O2. I need a bracket. Whatever my given is, just like if I was doing a metric conversion, goes on the bottom. In this case, I'm going to use one mole of O2 because I'm going moles of A to moles of B. So I'm going to get my numbers from the balanced equation. Moles of O2 cancels. I can convert moles of O2 to moles of H2O because I have an equation that relates them. And that relates them in a 1 to 2 ratio. So you can see this green number 1 comes from that green number 1. This blue number 2 comes from that number 2. This red number 4 comes right there from the problem. 4 times 2 is 8, and so I can make 8 moles of H2O. A mole to mole conversion is by far the easiest, all right? And whenever you have a mole ratio, it must come from the balanced equation. Try this one. How many moles of NH3 can be produced from the reaction of 8 moles of H2? All right. We need to write and balance an equation. This actually doesn't give us all of the information we need, so I'm going to give you the equation. It's H2 plus N2 is NH3. That's how we make ammonia. And we need to balance this, so let's balance it. We draw our line. We have hydrogen and nitrogen on the left. We have hydrogen and nitrogen on the right. We do our initial count. I have two hydrogens. I have two nitrogens. On the right side, I have three and I have one. I can't fix two and three, but I can definitely fix two and one. All right, so I'm going to go over here and I'm going to double this. So two times one nitrogen gives me two. Two times three gives me six. I can turn a two into a six with some pretty basic math, right? Two times three gives me six. So six and six checks out. Two and two checks out. So this must be a one. That's how we balance our equation. Drop those in. Three, one, two. The next thing we need to do is write our given and determine our mole ratio. So my given comes from the problem. It was eight moles of hydrogen. All right. I'm going to draw a bracket. Moles of hydrogen goes to the bottom. In this case, it's going to be three moles because that's what I have in the problem, three moles of H2. Moles cancels. I'm converting, according to the problem, to moles of NH3, right? That's what it asks me to find. So in... The equation, I see that I have three moles of hydrogen produces two moles of ammonia. So that's what I plug in there as my mole ratio. I do my math. Eight times two divided by three gives me 5.33 moles of ammonia. So that's our pretty simple one. That's our one bracket conversion. Now let's look at moles to mass. Okay. Again, if you need a break, take a break. Moles to mass, it's going to have a problem that looks something like this. Aluminum reacts with hydrochloric acid to produce aluminum chloride and hydrogen gas by the following equation. What mass of hydrogen can be produced by reacting six moles of aluminum with excess HCl? All right, just for a moment, let's pretend I wasn't going to give you the equation. You're going to have to write it yourself from this word problem. So some things that I, I need to know. I've got aluminum by itself. Aluminum is a metal. It's not diatomic, so it's just aluminum. It is going to react with hydrochloric acid. So acids start with H. Hydrochloric is a pretty common acid. It's HCl. It's going to produce aluminum chloride. All right. I know that aluminum exists as plus one. I know that chlorine exists as negative one. All right. And so, wait a minute. Aluminum exists as plus three. Excuse me. And I know that I'm going to cross my subscripts and I'm going to get AlCl3, there's my aluminum chloride, and I have hydrogen gas. I know that hydrogen is one of my diatomic molecules, so it needs a two. So make sure you can still apply your naming rules to write an equation, but in this case we gave you the equation. There it is. We need to balance it, all right? So I'm going to balance this by grouping. I'm just going to talk you through it. Um, I've got Three chlorines on the on the right. I've got two chlorines on, or one chlorine on the left. Okay. Oh, sorry. Actually, let's not do it by grouping. That's hard to do on a video. So let's just write it out. So we have AlC 
we have CL and we have H. When you do H last, AL, CL, and H, one, three, two. All right, we'll start with, let's say, I don't know. I start with chlorine. So we'll put a three right there. That gives me three chlorines. That gives me three hydrogens. That's good. That's good. Up oh, Now I have two and three, so that's not going to work. So I'm going to change this three to a six. And I'm going to put a three right there. So now I have six hydrogens. I have six chlorines. On the right, I have six hydrogens. I'm going to put a two right there. That gives me two aluminums and six chlorines. So that's good. That's good. And I have two aluminums on the left. So that's good. So two, six, two, three. I can't reduce that. So we've balanced it. Two, six, two, three. Now you'll notice I turned the aluminum two and the hydrogen two, uh, or the hydrogen three rather, into a color. We're going to need those from the problem. All right, we start with our given. Our given here is six moles of aluminum. All right, it tells me I have excess hydrochloric acid. That means I can ignore it. I'm going to go from moles of aluminum, all right, to moles of H2, right? I can convert moles to moles. It takes one bracket. We use the molar ratio. Two moles of aluminum produces three moles of hydrogen. Moles cancels, all right? So we're good there. But the problem asks me for mass of hydrogen. So I don't want to stop at moles. I've used my molar ratio from the equation, but now I need to go from, you know, moles of Y to grams of Y, or moles of B to grams of B, whatever you want to, variable you want to use there. So I need another bracket. Put one mole of H2 on the bottom, and I'm going from moles to mass, so I'm using the periodic table. 2.016 grams of H2 is equal to a mole. Now my moles of H2 cancels. I'm left with grams of H2, which is the mass that the problem asked me for. And now I'm just going to go left to right and do my problem. So 6 times 3 divided by 2 times 2.016. So I'm going to calculate. It gives me 18.144 grams of hydrogen. So that is a mole to mass calculation. Here's the, the next step. All right, here's the next more complicated step, right? It's, it's not that it's any different. It's just adding um, brackets and interpretation to it. So when we find, let me move my face out of the way just for a second. Okay. Um, the limiting reactant and the theoretical yield, basically a reaction is never going to react in such a way that every single atom of two reactants is completely used up perfectly. The laws of thermodynamics will not allow that. One of the reactants is going to run out first. We call that the limiting reactant because it limits how much product can be made. It's called the limiting reactant. The one that, or sorry, the amount of product that the limiting reactant makes is called the theoretical yield. It's the amount in theory that is the maximum amount of product you can make. It's the maximum amount because when the limiting reagent runs out, you can't make any more product. All right, so that should be pretty obvious, right? That those two things are tied together. They're, they're kind of married. So let's take this equation. We used it a minute ago, so we're going to use it again. We're given 18 grams. All right, hold on, let me move my picture again. Good. We're given 18 grams of aluminum, and we have 35 grams of HCl. What's the limiting reactant? What's the theoretical yield of H2 from the reaction? So theoretical yield should be in grams. So here we're going from grams of aluminum to grams of hydrogen. And we're also going to go grams of HCl to grams of hydrogen. So we're going to actually have to do two sets of brackets in order to come to this answer. First thing we need to do is figure out how much product each reactant can make. So let's start with aluminum. All right, 18 grams of aluminum was given to me in my problem. I know from that, um, from that diagram earlier that it's going to take three brackets to go from grams of something to grams of something else. In case you don't remember that, let's look at it real quick. So if I go back to this, remember, if I have known substance, so right, mass is grams, so I have grams of A, and I'm going to grams of B. Well, I need to use the periodic table. I need to use the balanced equation. I need to use the periodic table. That never changes. The order doesn't change. I'm crossing three of these lines, so that's a three-bracket conversion. 
Let me get us back over here. So I'm going to go ahead and set up my three brackets. My given goes to the bottom. So since I'm starting with grams of aluminum, I'm going to put grams of aluminum on bottom. Grams of aluminum is going to go to moles of aluminum. That's my periodic table bracket. Moles of aluminum then goes to the bottom. I'm going to convert moles of aluminum to moles of hydrogen. This is my molar ratio bracket. It's coming from the numbers in the balanced equation. And then I'm going to go from moles of hydrogen to grams of hydrogen. This is my second periodic table bracket. When I calculate this, we'll see grams of aluminum is top and bottom, so it cancels. Moles of aluminum cancels. Moles of H2 cancels. And I'm left with grams of hydrogen which is exactly what the question asked me for. Yield of H2. Theoretical yield needs to be in grams. It needs to be a mass, all right? Something that I could measure at the end of a lab to see how close I was. This tells me that I'm going to have 2.017 grams of hydrogen from 18 grams of aluminum. Periodic table bracket first. Molar ratio bracket second. Periodic table bracket third. Well, the second thing I need to do is I need to figure out who's in excess. So I need to run the same steps, but now I need to do it with HCl. I need to see how much hydrogen I can make from that 35 grams of HCl in our problem. So I start with my given, 35 grams of HCl. It's still three brackets. It's still going to be periodic table, molar ratio, periodic table. But now I have to plug it in for HCl. So the mass of HCl from the periodic table in grams per mole. Convert moles of HCl to moles of H2. Again, these two numbers, 6 and 3, come from right here. 6 and 3. They're my molar ratio numbers. Then I'm going to go periodic table, moles of H2 to grams of H2. Now, notice something. This section of the bracket does not change in those two conversions. And the reason for that is we're trying to end with grams of H2 on both sides. So you can't compare apples to oranges, but if you can convert and compare like terms, in this case, I can't compare grams of aluminum to grams of HCl, but I can compare grams of hydrogen to grams of hydrogen, right? The, the terms are the same, so the back ends of the bracket should be the same. Now that I have a conversion, let's kind of summarize it and look at it, or, or sorry, now that I have an outcome. So... I want to analyze these numbers. According to that math we just did, 18 grams of aluminum can make up to 2.017 grams of hydrogen in that reaction. 35 grams of hydrochloric acid can make up to 0.967 grams of hydrogen. So I look at those two numbers and I say, okay, I know my vocab. The theoretical yield is made by the limiting reactant. The limiting reactant is going to run out first. Because the limiting reactant runs out first, it makes the least amount of product. So, since HCl runs out before aluminum, it makes the least amount of product of the two, HCl limits. And that's how I would give that answer. I would say, like, what's the limiting reactant? Well, hydrochloric acid limits. The reason that I do the calculation this way is that the moment I've found the limiting reactant, I have also found the theoretical yield because the limiting reactant makes the theoretical yield. So the theoretical yield of H2 is 0.967 grams. Now, there are lots of different ways you can find the theoretical yield and the limiting reactant. I like this way the best because it gives me the answer, and all I have to do are those two conversions. Since I know the theoretical yield and I know the limiting reagent, I also know aluminum is in excess. So I've found three answers in two calculations. So that's the PowerPoint on stoichiometry. Hopefully that answers some of your questions. Um, feel free to go back and watch this thing as many times as you need to. If you have questions, shoot me an email, and I'll be glad to help you out. All right, keep working hard, uh, and I will see you guys in the next video, okay?